if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put them. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he wouldn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, they hadn't understood the Scriptures that said that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb. She was crying and she wept. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in too. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the, do- of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognise him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. And so she said, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and she cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, The disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, He said. As He spoke, He showed them the wounds in His hands and His side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then He breathed on them and He said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when the Lord came and they told him, we have seen the Lord. And he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with him, with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. I love Mount Monganui. Love being here with the Fano. We came down on Friday, uh, packed the roof. The roof basket, thanks guys, sorry, you, you're so amazing. Uh, packed the roof basket, uh, everything that was waterproof went on top of the car except for my duffel bag. Uh, that wasn't waterproof, but it was on top of my car. We came down uh, through the rain and as you come over the Kaimais, you see paradise, the most perfect rainbow I have ever laid my eyes on. And here we were, 
markets yesterday, hot pools, paradise. The only place better is Auckland. (laughs) Our markets are better. (laughs) Our hot pools, rest in peace, why wetter? Our hot pools were better. (laughs) And your traffic's just the same as ours now because so many Aucklanders have come down to you. (laughs) Encounters with the resurrected Christ. Uh, It's an amazing... Uh, topic. We're here at Easter tide. We're uh, outside of Easter, reflecting on what the Easter message really means. And who better to reflect on that with than the person of Christ? Last week we talked about the road to Emmaus, and I know uh, one of my favourite preachers, John, did an incredible job here. Um, I did a less than incredible job in Auckland, obviously. Um, but we hear in that story of a couple, I think they might be married, scandal. Cleopas and someone else, I think it might be a husband and wife, returning from the mission field. They've been on mission with Jesus and they're disappointed. They're disappointed, they're sad. They had such great expectations and those expectations feel like they were for nothing now. I can resonate with it. I've been through these seasons and I've walked with my wife as we've talked about, where was God in that? I thought He sent us to do that. And many of us in this room have been on a similar road from to Emmaus. We've been on a similar road from, from the mission field or from what we thought was the purpose of God and, and that season has changed and we've become disappointed and we've become sad. On the road to Emmaus, we realise that Jesus joins us on that walk. Not necessarily do we realise it's Jesus, but He joins us on that journey and He points to all the ways He's been working that we might not have seen. Jesus wants to, this morning, join us on a journey and point to all the ways He's been working that we haven't seen because our eyes are a little bit funky. Our eyes show us the facts. But when we're in the presence of Jesus, that's when we discover the truth. And so your eyes will let you down. All they have for you is fact. It's in the presence of Jesus that we discover the truth. Today's passage uh, doesn't feature two fairly anonymous people. It features 10 fairly prominent people, 10 disciples. Uh, one of whom is missing when this story begins. The best thing about these stories is they invite us to participate within them. They invite us to see ourselves in the story. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking I'm speaking on Doubting Thomas this morning. Uh, It might surprise you, but I don't think he's all that doubting. I I was in Sunday school and I remember the flannel graph and I remember talking about doubting Thomas and I remember, you know, this frightening, frightening kids' church illustrations. You know, I remember putting my hands through the holes of the flannel graph. (laughs) But this is not that. I don't think Thomas is doubting. I think it's much worse than that. I think he's resisting arrest. See, Thomas, he knows what Jesus said he would do. In fact, by the time we find him, and I promise I'm gonna get to the story soon, by the time we find him, all his friends have seen Jesus. He has all the facts in the world that Jesus exists. More proof than you and I. But he's resisting arrest. He doesn't want to believe. He's not doubting. He's resisting arrest. In verse 19, we find the disciples. We define the disciples and we find Jesus. Jesus has had a pretty big day. He got up out of bed, took off his grave's clothes, had an up and go, quick coffee with Mary Magdalene. He meets the other women in Matthew 28. He walks with Cleopas and his wife on the road to Emmaus. He catches up with Peter. And now he stops by church to see his disciples. It's been a busy day. But church doesn't look right, does it? 
verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. We don't meet a couple disappointed and sad. We meet a group fearful and insecure. They're petrified. They've locked the doors. You can imagine being there. Every sound they hear outside is the guards coming to arrest them. Every time a donkey walks past, it's a carriage coming to take them to be whipped, stoned, or worse, crucified. They're living in fear. What if they come for us? What if they do to us? Those are what they did to Him. Those who know Jesus to be alive They're wondering, what if they think we did it? What if they think we injected him with some super soldier serum? What if they think we're party to this chaos that will ensue now that Jesus is truly alive? What will we do? A church hiding in fear is not a church on purpose. Disciples hiding in fear are not disciples on purpose. Jesus has said to them, I came to bring life and life truly abundant, life fully alive, life exploding with lifeness. And yet here they are hiding behind locked doors and then He appears. don't know what it sounded like, but that felt appropriate. (laughs) Was it a rushing wind? Did somebody leave the locked door open? It doesn't matter. What matters is in the midst of your fear and the midst of your insecurity, nothing will keep Jesus away because He's there. Peace be with you. And it's that same voice that still speaks to us even now in our disappointment and sadness, in our fear and our insecurity. It's the same voice, peace. Peace be with you. Peace we know that passes understanding, that keeps our hearts. Peace be with you. The same voice that stilled the storm, stills the storm in them. See my hands, see my side. And their eyes are open and they see the Lord. Peace be with you as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. It's not a dig. It's not a reminder that they're not a very good church if they're behind locked doors. It's an encouragement because it's backed up with a gift. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The Holy Spirit. Friends, we are not meant to be locked up. We are meant to receive the Holy Spirit. It's the only answer to your insecurity. It's the breath of life. It's the royal stamp of heavenly approval. It's God's royal seal upon your life and upon your future. And that future requires that you unlock the doors. Unlock the doors and walk out with that spirit into the world. We haven't got to Thomas yet. I'm just dealing with the 10. I've been breathed on. The Holy Spirit has entered into them like breath entered into Adam. So they are recreated. And then they go. And we don't know what happens. It's like SpongeBob SquarePants. Eight days later. Right? Verse 24, now Thomas, 
one of the 12 called the twin. Who's the twin? That's you and me, just FYI. Thomas called the twin. Do you, do you, if you're not Thomas, do you know a Thomas? Like I know a few Thomases. Tommy, Tomboy, Tomato. Made that one up, that wasn't in the notes. We all know Thomases. Like the disciples resisting arrest, quite literally, we know Thomases who are resisting arrest. Right? We know people who should know better. We know people who are surrounded by Christians who have the power and love of Jesus in their life and flowing from their life, but they are resisting arrest. We all know Thomases. Some of us are Thomases. The worst kind. Well, it's not the worst. I'm not, I'm not saying you're the worst kind if you're one of these. Um, but the interestingest kind are generational Thomases. I feel like I'm surrounded by generational Thomases. New Zealand has such a rich legacy of faith, right? Tauranga. I mean, Jesus' blood is in the soil of this place, right? Such a rich Christian heritage. Yet so many generational Thomases. So many Thomases resisting arrest, even though my parents were Christian. My parents are Christian. I know they pray for me. Oh, my grandfather was a missionary. I should tell you the stories. No, bro, listen to the stories. Generational Thomases, what a waste. Jesus, that you would reveal yourself to generational Thomases who have all the facts but their eyes can't see the truth. There's another kind of Thomas too. The I believe in God, Thomas. You met those people? You tell them you're a Christian or you're having some chat about church. They go, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I'm a good guy, big guy in the sky. Love that guy. <sighs> Haven't read much of his book, but great guy. It's kind of like, I'll deal with it later. It's like, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that when I get to that. You know, like it's on my to-do list. I'll explore God eventually. I might even find out he had a son. I might even find out that that son died for me, for my sin, for my shame. I might even find out too late to really undo all that pain. I could be living now free, right? That's the thing about facts. Facts don't free anyone, only the truth sets free. And so those people who've thought about God, who know Him but haven't met His son yet, haven't been bothered to turn up at the house, meet the whanau. Man. Verse 25. Verse 25 brings us to pain, if I if I'm honest. Uh, so the disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side. Bro, do you know what you're saying? That's gross, not to mention totally unsanitary. I refuse to believe unless I get my finger in there and my hand in there, I refuse to believe. Not only are you offending God at this point, you're offending 10 of your best mates. And eight days later, we know what's coming eight days later. Church, they're back together again. Eight days later, Thomas was with them and although the doors were locked. Okay, so they got the Holy Spirit. 
But have you ever had a, the cross is like an operating system, right? When we, when we discover Christ and Christ crucified, it changes the way we see everything, right? The Holy Spirit, if the cross is an operating system, the Holy Spirit is a software update, right? And who knows, when you put a software update on a really old phone, it pretty much does nothing to change it. It bricks it, right? See, the disciples have seen the cross, the power of the cross, and they've had the Holy Spirit breathed into their lungs, right? But they haven't let the Holy Spirit change them. The hardware is still old. And so a week later, they find themselves once again, together as they should be, remembering the Lord as they should be, but all the doors are locked. All the doors are locked. But Thomas, old mate, finally agreed to come to church. I've been praying for him for at least eight days. And here he is. You've brought that person to church. Praying. I hope church doesn't embarrass me. Thomas, come on. He might just show up. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Shalom. Then it's like the air leaves the room. Peace be with you. And it's so awkward because everybody knows why he's here. He's not here for the ones who believe. He's here for the one who doesn't. And I don't know about you, but I think this could be one of the most beautiful moments in all of Scripture. I imagine Thomas sitting at a table. He's probably pretty puffed up. He knows better. He's feeling pretty self-confident. All these idiots. And then Jesus shows up. And I think he comes down to Thomas's level. Because no way Thomas is getting up. He refuses. And I think he just puts out his hand. Come on. If you want to, it's here. If I was Jesus, I wouldn't be showing that level of compassion. I feel like I would have had showed enough by now. I wouldn't have that level of grace. Thank God I'm not the saviour. Because Jesus comes in tenderness, in gentleness, in exactly the way we need to break down the walls that we didn't even know we put up, that he might speak to our souls. Tender, gracious, even with a backdrop of resistance. You might know the facts, Thomas. This truth will set you free. Friends, we might know the facts. The fact is, that there's a mountain out there. It's beautiful. It's tall. And my son would like to know if it's taller than Sky Tower. I told him to look it up on Google. Because Google can show him the facts but Google can't show him the sunrise. The facts that there are sunrises can't help you feel the truth of the sunrise, the warmth on your cheeks, the smell of the salty air, 
the beauty of the wildflowers that grow up the path. We had a whole lot of people do a pamper day last week. A whole lot of ladies came, got pampered. The fact is they got beautified. The truth is they were beautiful to begin with. Your eyes are useless at facts. Well, your eyes are great at facts. The facts are useless to you. Only the truth will set you free. And if the road to Emmaus and Thomas resisting arrest in the upper room tells us anything, it's that truth is only discovered in the presence of God. So the band's gonna come up and we're gonna spend some time in the presence of God. There is so much more in this chapter. I'd love to continue going. But what's more important is not the facts of verse 30, 31. The fact is the book keeps going. And there's more to read. The truth is right now we need the presence of God. And so would you stand with me? Auckland, I hope Penny's up there. No? Sandro? Whoever? Would we just spend time in the presence of God this morning? Would we stop resisting arrest? Would we allow ourselves once again to be captivated, to be captured? by the gentleness, the compassion and the power of the risen Christ. And may it compel us to unlock the doors, the doors of our heart, the doors of the rooms that we find ourselves in. Thomas is radically changed by this moment. He dies in India. Thousands and th you're like, did India even exist? He dies in India thousands and thousands of kilometres from where he met Jesus. In a cave where men brandishing weapons told him to deny Christ. done that once he's not going to make the same mistake again I reckon it was eight days of absolute turmoil for Thomas that he was not going to relive again so there he met his end he wouldn't deny tender gracious wonderful Jesus so there in a cave in India he took on his own scar from a spear in the side and he met to see his Jesus once more.